Welcome to another show of Celebrate Life. My name is Gary DeCarlos, and I'll be your host. The goal for this series is to show the amazing lives that people live, both here in Vermont and in some cases outside of Vermont. Um, over the years, I've read too many obituaries and come away feeling, gosh, I wish I had a chance to get to know that person. And so for this show, we're going to actually bring you into the lives of some very special people around Vermont and actually around the country at times to celebrate their lives. One thing I've, I've learned is that everybody has fascinating lives to tell and share, and everyone has a story to tell. So um, I uh, encourage you to relax, sit down, enjoy the show. And um, if perchance you have any interest in being interviewed on this show, please be in touch with me at celebrate life 0747 at gmail.com. Or if you have a question for our guest today, uh, again, uh, email me at celebrate life 0747 at gmail.com and I'll be glad to get it over to the, uh, to the guest and have them respond uh, in like kind. Well, today I'm honored to have as our guest, uh, Michael Kucher. Michael, today we're gonna to celebrate your life. And uh, you've had, in many ways, in my eye, a storied life in the artistic realm, a photographer, videographer, records producer, singer, and a recovery coach extraordinaire. Um, so I'd like to, if you wouldn't mind, take us back to where it all started. Um, I know you're a Vermonter um, and, um, what was your early life like and how did it lead to the person you are today? Hi, Gary, thanks for having me. This is a, a pleasure. Um, yeah, I grew up in Morrisville, Vermont, a small town, um, just right outside, uh, right next to Stowe. And um, without a lot of perspective, I think my life was pretty normal, at least normal up until my teens. And then things started uh, changing. But, um, you know, small town, uh, very tight. Uh, we had, uh, uh, I, I give my siblings, I have a brother and a sister, half brother and a sister, and uh, they were both born in New York. So I give them, they don't get the native Vermonter. <laughs> label. Uh, label, right. Exactly. So, uh, but, you know, I grew up uh, just outside of town and had a really kind of storied earlier childhood. Uh, I had really good friends and I grew up uh, right near a mill pond. Mm -hmm. And we just had so much fun on that. We ran logs, we fished, we, you know, had bonfires at night, we hunted, we built cabins, we built rafts and just had so wow. much fun out there mm. and it was pretty good wholesome you know growing mm -hmm. up fun. and uh we also uh my sister and i had uh horses uh as we were growing up wow. sort of nice. in the youth i think in hindsight they were more i think my mother liked them more than we did she grew up with horses and, and loved them. Uh, and we learned how to ride. We learned in English, did three-day eventing, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, stadium jumping, cross country, and dressage. Wow. And uh, learned how to do that and did that for years, uh, up until I was about 16 or 17. Mm -hmm. And um, at, at when I was about 13, I uh, went to Boston for a couple of weeks and learned how to play polo, wow. which was, you know, not something that very many people in Morrisville have the opportunity to do. Right. And in fact, I was sort of embarrassed about it because, you know, you know, the, the strata of. Right. People. Right. Right. Uh, but I, it, the game was fantastic. It was mm -hmm. really incredible uh, athletic you know, dangerous game. Yes, yes. Um, I, I, uh, things 
went off the rails a little bit in uh, teen years because uh, normal teen stuff, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, small town. If you weren't on a on a uh, athletic team, you you know, driving the back roads, drinking beer, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, which you know, I never gotten into very much trouble at all. But you know, that's back in you know senior junior year where we would have huge parties in the woods uh, and uh you know but mainly they were just kind of cookouts and uh -huh. being with my friends you know in hindsight it didn't look so bad um uh, i did a lot of skiing growing up growing next to stowe i uh i was instinctual on skis from the time of you know three and a half or four on Mm. My dad had been uh, not only in the ski patrol, but he was he was an instructor in at Stowe, and that's how he met my mother. Okay. The reason I have a half brother is because uh, my mom was married, and her first husband was killed in World War II, mm. and she ended up coming uh, from Connecticut up here to go skiing, and met the instructor <laughs> and that's the end of that story isn't that something yeah yeah so it was your father was that ski instruction was that his career or was that something he did part-time no he that was sort of on the weekends and other times uh he uh well he was the manager of uh union carbide which was uh, the record center for the whole company, the mm -hmm. international company. Nobody even knows what Union Carbide is anymore, but it was a, it was a very large multinational company. Uh, and if you remember, the the downfall of the company was when there was a chemical spill in India, in Bhopal, India, that killed a lot of people. And that was it was the Union Carbide company, and that did them in. Uh, but that my father had, uh, you know, had passed away long before that. So yeah. he had a really, he was lucky Morrisville or Phoenix, Arizona, I think, were the two places that they had chosen as the safest places in the country during the Cold War. Amazing. Yeah. So that's where the, all the records were there. All the records of Union Carbide were in Morrisville, Vermont. Exactly. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. So... so he he did that and he skied and, and uh, okay. he was also uh, a pilot uh, back when he was 18 and went into the uh, Army Air Corps. He had more flying hours than the instructors did. Right. And he wanted to, he wanted to fly fighters, but they wouldn't let him because he had too much time. So they put him on transports and it really annoyed the hell out of him. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Where do you get that creative part of you? That's quite- I think, I think, you know, if there's a genetic part to it, I would have gotten it through my mother was artistic, but her father, uh, who I never knew was at, uh, an architect in Manhattan and Connecticut mm -hmm. and pretty well known. And uh, he was an artist as well. Okay. And I still have, I don't know, 80, 85 paintings of his that are really amazing. Wow. And, you know, I always had some sort of a creative itch. Yeah. And I, it took me a long time to figure out how to scratch it. Yep. Yep. Um, yep. But it started out with me in high school, uh, a bunch of my friends uh, and I started a band. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we're, we always had a very active music um, presence in our schools. Um, a gentleman named uh, Bob Yanni got everybody involved with music and, and we mm -hmm. all continued with that. Uh, and I think everybody in the band ended up doing music, either in wow. a band or teaching. Wow. So, Interesting. Yeah. And uh, so while I was... Uh, in high school, we were in the band, and I also was on ski patrol at Stowe. Mm -hmm. And um, 
you know, we we did a lot of uh, playing around the high schools and also at fraternities at UVM. Okay. And uh, had a good time. That's pretty much how I paid through college for college. Wow. What was the name um, of the band? A couple of names. The end, the final end was Public Informal Gathering, okay. which was Pig, of course. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's kind of, you know, we thought it was kind of cool then. And now looking back, it's like, well, I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, not, not, not quite the same resonance as Beatles. Not quite. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, although the musicianship was pretty darn good, and we did a bunch of uh, uh, original cool. stuff. Wow, no kidding. And that sort of led me into, um, let me back up just a minute. Yeah. Um, when I was a, fr I wanted to go to med school. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I went into UVM, that's what I was looking to do. And my freshman year, second semester, my mom died of a pulmonary, pulmonary embolism. Mm. And that took the wind out of my sails. Mm. And that's when I started a unhealthy relationship with alcohol. Okay, yeah. You know, I, uh, it, was, it was really difficult for me and I didn't really realize how difficult it was because you know, growing up, a guy, a French Canadian background in Vermont, yep. Catholic upbringing, every message I got from everybody it was suck it up, move on, don't grieve. Right. right. And that's, that's where my relationship with alcohol came. Yep. And I, uh, it became my go to practice for when everything got, anything got stressful or yep. hard or difficult. And, uh, that continued for many, many years. Even though I was always productive, I never missed work, and I never mm -hmm. was arrested or any of that stuff. It was mm -hmm. a, it was an internal head problem that I need, you know, yeah. self medication basically. Right. You were depressed. You lost your mom, and alcohol was a a friend that could take you away from that. Yeah, and um, so I was at UVM, and you know, partying was not a problem to find. That you right. right and uh i you know i i had to stay in school because i really didn't want to go to vietnam mm. that was the big vietnam era yeah and you know 1969 70 yep. and uh, i would have gone but i was lucky enough to get a high lottery pick number although they got very close to it uncomfortably close to it because my grades were not good enough to you know keep me there okay and i just had friends out of high school who went and didn't come back or came back different yep. and you know same with college you know early college yep. guys would head off and you know slap them on the back and they would come back totally different yep. person yep. so yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I keep been. No, no, I was going to, you know, so it sounded like, although you at some point understood the gravity of what alcohol was doing to your life, you were able to function through, through using that. What, what, what changed for you to say, okay, this, I, this can't go on like this. What was the. Oh, well, that happened many years, decades later. I mean, yep. I, I used alcohol for many, many years. Yep. And when I was 58, I looked at myself and said, I can't do this treadmill anymore because I was waking up in the morning feeling lousy, mm -hmm. uh, promising I wouldn't do it again, going to work, working hard all day, promising mm -hmm. I'm not going to do this again. Five o'clock rolls around and the, the pressure of my business at that point, we had 350 employees and the pressure of that many family families yeah. relying on my brother and I and partners was heavy. And, mm. uh, you know, I just had to kind of anesthetize myself. And I, I got to the realization that I didn't want to do that anymore, that I was postponing my life. 
really, I was kind of on hold every day. Yeah. yeah. And feeling right. like not living my life. And I just didn't want to do that anymore. And mm. uh, found a 12 step program. And, and that has been my saving grace since then. Mm. Wow. So, okay. So you were that treadmill, that, that visual image of a treadmill seemed very appropriate. But, yeah. Going nowhere, but moving constantly. Yeah. I mean, I thought, I, I thought feeling bad in the morning was how grown-ups felt right yeah. you know until i stopped and i was well wow yeah you can yeah. actually feel good yeah wow so um backing up to you know college yeah. my dad died uh six years later when i was 25 wow. Wow. and that's about the time it before that when i was a sophomore at, at uvm my brother and i decided that we would start a recording studio. Mm -hmm. And um, he had owned a barn down in North Ferrisburg, which he had you know, fixed for his family. And, and we started recording there and mm -hmm. uh, built it up pretty well. Um, had the first 16 track recording studio in the state. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was recorded back on two inch tape. Wow. And um, did that for a couple of years and then we decided that we were we were getting to know and uh knowing about a lot of really amazing musicians both here in this country in canada and in the british isles mm. and so we started uh philo records okay. which yeah. uh some people know some people don't know but we yeah. uh, we ended up uh you know starting a record company what the hell do we know? We'll just start a record company. <laughs> wow. And well, Philo Records has a huge reputation. I mean, even till today, people know that label. Yeah. That's um, a lot of the musicians with us have passed, which is unfortunate. But uh, you know, people like David Van Ronk and uh, Rosalie Sorrells and Utah Phillips, and um, <laughs> I, I know most people don't even know those people anymore dave van ronk was a pretty well known uh yeah. new york artist yeah and we had we were pretty well known in canada we were actually considered a major record company in canada because we wow. had a lot of french canadian uh fiddlers and you know really well known people in canada wow. and the british isles wow we had uh, the boys of the lock and gene redpath and um they would all come over and you know, record their albums at our place, or in some cases, like the Boys of the Lock, I would, uh, you know, fill my car up and go to the uh, uh, to Harvard and wow. record them at uh, you know a coffee house there wow. live. Wow! Um, so we we had a lot of people. We had about two hundred records, two hundred artists with multiple records. Wow! That's amazing. Yeah. Where did you develop the business acumen to, to do that? Well, I I sort of uh, veered toward the technology and the and the recording part, and and my brother Bill was the he was running the business basically. Okay, got gotcha. you. Uh, but neither of us started with business acumen. We just, you know. That's amazing. You can make all the mistakes in the world, but only make them once. Right. But uh, <laughs> the, the, you know, in terms of business, it, it would, the record business was really difficult because it, we had to pay in 10 days to get the records. But on our end, it was a consignment business. So we'd send a thousand records to some place and they'd send us, you know, six months later, they'd send us a check and 800 of the records back. Uh-huh, yeah. Or, in that was in the days of the uh, pirating. Mm -hmm. So they order 1,000 and send you 1,200. Wow. Um, which, you know, was hard. That, you know, wow. we, could, we had a hard time cash flowing all that stuff. And, and wow. it was very difficult. Wow. I mean, we barely paid ourselves and that kind of stuff. Wow. How did the artists 
come to know you? How did you market the phylum? Our calling card was that we thought that the artists knew best how to present themselves uh, with instrumentation and you know that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So we we said that we leave the artistry to the artists. You know, we let them have full creative control. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you know, that's one of the th- bylines that I go by is that I really liked um, solving creative uh, challenges with a, a good thought process and technology, mm. trying to be transparent to the art. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, wow. which is why I've always been on the other side of the camera that I'm on right now. <laughs> <laughs> so this must have been a really fun time for you as much as it sounds like at the same time, a pressured time. Uh, incredible, it, incredible musical moments. Yes. Like with Kilimanjaro and, uh, you know, some of the bands and some of the vocalists were fantastic and they were amazing moments, but long hours mm-hmm. into the night, as you would guess from art musicians. Yep. Um, and really hard on growing kids and a yeah. family. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And not a, it's not a nine to five job. No, no. no. Especially, if you, especially if you live at the studio. You know, you get up in the morning and, pe- you know, there's 50 kids there on a school tour and then you have to work to three or four in the next morning. Wow. Wow. Amazing. And at some point you said this enough's enough. I'm going to we're going to cash our chips in on this. It was a business, uh, you know, you know. Trying to sustain the business was difficult mm-hmm. and uh, we ended up having to, you know, uh, declared chapter 11 okay and we basically sold the assets to rounder records in boston okay and okay. they continued to release philo records hmm. you know, for decades afterwards wow yeah wow so let's go if we can go back a, a little bit further in your life again michael whether it's special people early on in your life that played a role in your who you come to be? Yeah, there were a number of people. I, I would say the most important person in my life was my grandmother, uh, Elise, my dad's mom. She was just always there. She was not judgmental. And she just was an amazing example of how to live. Mm. She, she was... Uh, I don't know, she just lived in the moment and she had wonderful ways of guiding us. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, she was just a strong, strong woman. She was, mm. she was probably maybe a little bit under five feet, but okay. strong. She's a powerhouse. And I think my siblings would agree with me with that. But she, mm-hmm. she was the um, nexus of yeah. Yeah. direction for us. You know, she, especially even when mom and dad died, she was right there. Oh, that's fantastic. Was she close by in Morrisville? She was in Morrisville. In fact, uh, every Sunday, my whole life, we would go to Graham's at, uh, you know, after her mass. Um, and, you know, that happened through high school, through college. I would bring college buddies with me to Graham's for breakfast and we'd be hung over and you know, uh, and then I, that followed through with my kids, mm-hmm. even living down in Bristol and, you know, in Burlington, every Sunday, I'd pack them up and drive over to Graham's wow. because she lived to 102. Wow. Yeah. And Fantastic. She was ended up in a nursing home, but she, uh, you know, she would be off in her own kind of mantra world, you know, trying to ask God to take her. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you'd walk in the room and she would pop right to it and be totally there and ask you about the meeting you had on Tuesday and how it was, you know, wow. she was right there. Wow. That's amazing. 
Uh, so um, I, I mean, there were other people in the in the Morrisville area. Uh, one uh, a guy named Ron Terrell, who basically owned the local Texaco station, but he was a good friend of my family's, and he was a gourmet cook and a a Russian historical history buff. Mm. I mean, he was just an interesting guy. Mm. And uh, he, he uh, would come to our house, you know, once every couple, three weeks and cook this amazing meal. And we would just talk. And, you know, I got to sit with a lot of uh, adults and kind of learn about life that way. Yeah. One of which was a guy named um, Father Jim Dodge who started out as a, uh, um, I think he started out as a Methodist or Congregational and ended up as a, uh, a priest, a Catholic priest. Mm. And uh, he uh, was the priest at uh, Trap Family Lodge. Oh my goodness. But they didn't provide a place for him to live. So he lived in our cellar. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. He's wow. a wonderful guy, really wonderful guy, just, you know, very personable. And uh, we used to ski with him a lot, mm -hmm. take us up and we'd ski. And, uh, you know, he would come to our, uh, you, one of the questions you asked was about vacations and, and you know, stuff. And yeah. we, did, we didn't do vacations, but we had a wonderful, wonderful camp on Lake Willoughby. Mm which I still, to this day, that's where my heart is. Mm. Uh, you've seen the picture I took. The, Absolutely uh, beautiful I picture. I, I hope you'll, um, we'll, we'll be able to show that on this uh, interview. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I know I was asked to put some together and I haven't had a chance at this point. But that's I'll, okay. I'll, I will do it. Okay. Um, anyways, I, I remember Father Dodge bringing a relic with him to our camp and he would say mass in our dining area on our table mm. and then we'd all go swimming interesting wow pretty cool he's a pretty interesting guy wow. uh and of course my dad my dad was very influential yeah he was always very competent at what he did and um kind of calm and uh intelligent and just steady mm -hmm. which uh you know i go i go to whenever i get crazy yeah. anxiety ridden i i just remember dad and my grand and yeah it sounds like his mom him and actually you have that same sense about you from my experience of you it's just you're steady as they go well thank you bring that into your work as well so um, a little bit before, a, a little bit after dad died, I fell in love and got married immediately with uh, a gal that was at UVM when I was there, but she, we didn't know each other at UVM <clears throat> and I came back together and uh, had kids immediately. This is early thirties. And yeah. at the same time, my brother, Bill and I, um, started resolution which uh, this is after philo now right about the same time as you know philo uh, we started resolution and we knew that um we wanted to keep uh in the media business but so we we found two other partners who were in the video business because we knew that's where things were going okay and uh so we started resolution there six of us, mm. uh, four partners, and then a secretary, and I don't know, I don't, maybe there was only five of us, <laughs> and a producer, that's right. So okay. yeah. uh, we, we started that up, and within three years, we had 320 employees. Oh my God. And uh, we sort of invented the concept of um there were there were two parts to resolution the part i was in and one of my partners was in was the production company part and we did um historical documentaries for a and e 
Discovery, um, uh, Turner, PBS, that kind of stuff. Yep. Yeah. And um, that sort of carried the company for a while while it was learning what it was going to be. And the other part of the um, company, we duplicated, started out duplicating audio cassettes for the Bose Corporation mm -hmm. and General Motors. They had audio um, clubs that every month they would release, you know, a cassette with right. stuff. Okay. Huh. So we started out there and we ended up being the only real time audio cassette duplicator in the country and the largest. Good. We had 1200 machines that we, that we could start and stop at the same time and play the master tape and you know, record them. So we would do the, all that, package them up and sell them to them and that was good. And then we moved the same concept into video for all of the networks that were growing, you know, the Food Network and you know, just all the different networks that were growing. Um, they had shows that they people wanted right. so we became the the nexus for that and then it grew into example food network you know can oh can you also sell our aprons and our knives and our uh, cutting boards and our books and our so we ended up with two hundred and sixty thousand square feet of warehouse where it's it's now uh it's just off uh uh marshall drive uh it's across the street from the old edge there and yipe stripes and it's it's i think uh, green mountain coffee has it now okay but we w the four partners built a building prior to the big warehouse which is now the um south burlington police department oh huh. okay so, yeah um so you know we grew into that and you know that's part of what the uh, uh anxiety yeah you know thing but it was also fun i mean we we got to travel around the world um shooting you know amazing stories yeah. we did a four-hour special on the history of money wow we did a four-hour special on the history of california wow and, you know, it's weird, a Vermont company going to California and doing that. <laughs> and where was that shown on TV? A&E. &E. Both a &E. of them were A&E. Okay, yeah. Yeah, we did the history of um, the great, it was called Floating Palaces, but the, the great ships of the North Atlantic uh, wow. back in the turn of the last century. Um, like including the Titanic thing, boats like yeah. that? Yeah, the Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth and just all, you know, the whole um, um, life, yeah, life the, time of all of those things. Those you know. luxury boats, those big yep. luxury boats. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and we got to go on the uh, Queen Mary 2 on hmm. two passages. I didn't because I was the editor. The editor <laughs> always stays, stays home in a black room. <laughs> But, wow. Yeah. But uh, th this is amazing. I mean, this, your story almost sounds like Ben Cohn and Jerry Greenfield with uh, Ben and Jerry's ice cream. It starts as a little scoop shop and all of a sudden it's this gigantic business. Um, well, I mean, not quite. Because, well, you know, because three, we thought we thought, OK, we'll sell resolution and, you know, I'll be able to have a place in St. John and, you know, right. that stuff didn't happen. <laughs> Technology eclipsed us. Uh, it went from, you know, VHS to uh, downloads. Yeah. In, you know, co very compressed co few years. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, uh, so no St. John's. Okay. Uh, but, but a, but a tremendous, I mean, that, what, what, how did you come to think of doing that? And how did you make those connections to these pretty um, large corporations that wanted to buy what you had to sell? Um, we, 
with resolution, it the marketplace kept changing and we had to change with it. Mm-hmm. I think we were really a different company about eight different times. Mm-hmm. And that's, that was sort of why we were good at it because we could. Yeah. We were pretty nimble about that kind of stuff. Yeah. And uh, my brother Bill had, you know, wonderful uh, marketing capabilities. We had a good marketing department as well. Uh, he would always tell the client he could do something. And then he'd turn to me and say, can we do it? <laughs> so, and you would say, okay. We and I would say, it. well, hang on, maybe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, uh, we were pretty nimble and we had to change every few years. We had to be a different company, really. Wow. And uh, we just listened and came up with ideas that people wanted. Yeah. And that obviously for all the, like Philo, for all the positive parts of that, you were going home and having a difficult time with that responsibility on your shoulders too. Yeah. 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 So my family brother, forgives me. They forgive you. Good. <laughs> yes. Families are good for that. You know, yeah. we're all human. Well, they have so. to. <laughs> Tell me about your kids. I have two boys. Mm-hmm. Um, they have been all over the country for various things, uh, but have both ended up back here in Burlington. Oh, nice. which is amazing to me. Uh, one is uh, just got his master's in special ed and is uh, going back, has gone back to school to become a principal. And um, he and his wife are here in Burlington. She's a, an attorney and an MSW. Wow. And uh, she, they both work very hard and have a son who is named after my dad. Nice. His name is Emil. Nice. And uh, my other son, uh, Sam, first son is Hunter. And Mm. Sam, uh, he lives here in town as well. His wife is a nurse anesthetist at uh, both Dartmouth and uh, UVM. Wow. And uh, he is an aquatic biologist who commutes every two weeks to Iceland, which is where his company is. He's a principal in a company that grows algae for fish food, for food pigments, for um, imitation meats. Uh, And they've just got more and more things happening all the time, you know, and the major markets are pretty much everywhere but the US for some reason. Interesting. It's a pretty large company. They're growing fast, and you know, mm. I, hope, I hope his outcome is better than mine was. <laughs> Both very successful. Sounds like they have good lives and interesting lives. They do, and and Sam and Lindsay have uh, two children, nice. um, Arlo and Eileen, uh, four and six. Nice. Yep. So you're a grandpa. That's best great. thing I've ever done. <laughs> it is rewarding, isn't it? Oh, gosh, I just love them so much. And I get to spend time with them. And they know who I am. I didn't know either of my grandfathers. Mm. And I'll be That's damned right. if they're going to not know me. That's right. Good for you. <laughs> Good for you. So um, when you reflect back, Michael, on the few years you've been around this earth, any any words of wisdom, um, any things that you glean from your life that you would like to share with other people? Sure. I mean, my dad always, and I think my grandmother too, always said this, and I use it every day. Always get there early and leave it better than you found it. Mm. Mm. And I, you know, that's just ingrained back in me. And that's, you know, how I try to do things. Mm. Uh, I, my biggest pet peeve these days is somebody who doesn't show up on time. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. it's really disrespectful. Yeah. But anyways, yeah. the, the uh, 
I heard a song recently that just impressed me, just a little segment of it. And it said, and I just, I think this is so cool. Um, in my heart, there is a compass. In my blood, there is a calling. In my head, there is a vision. And they call that the dream. Hmm. Which I, I just like it. I just, That's a beautiful, you know, say that again, Michael. In my heart, there is a compass. Yep. In my blood, there is a calling. In my head, there is a vision, and they call that the dream. Wow, that's beautiful. That's a, a woman named Lori McKenna. Hmm. That's um, beautiful. So, yeah, I, I like that a lot, too. So now you're doing recovery coaching in the emergency department at the University of Vermont Medical Center. I am. Oh. I, I, when I retired... I didn't know who I was because I was always what I did. Yeah. And I really got depressed and, you know, just was kind of aimless for a little bit. And I had to reinvent myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, photography has really injected itself into my life, mm -hmm. uh, both video and still photography. And so I found that. But thanks to you i um, found recovery coaching in the emergency department and uh you know through the turning point center here in burlington um that opportunity came up and you know that's when i was aimless and i didn't know what it was nobody knew what it was yeah okay. but i i said okay and it has been so amazingly fulfilling for me mm. Uh, I think we've helped a number of people. Yep. I mean, we have seen over nearly 500 people now. Mm. And uh, it's, it's just very fulfilling to get to know the docs, the PAs, and the nurses. Uh, they're going through a hard go right now because they, there's such a um, dearth of um, people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, the number of people in the emergency room working is is way down from what I re first remember it. Wow. And they're still asked to do every bit as much as ever was asked. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Burnout is pretty high. One of the days I went into the uh, emergency department and there were 19 people there in the morning. And I left in the afternoon, there was over 80. Wow. Wow. And, you know, and wow. the thing that is bothering me now, uh, Gary, and a lot of other people is that mental health is such an issue. Mm -hmm. First of all, I think substance use disorder is all mental health. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people are self medicating. Yep. Um, yep. But the, in the, the emergency room is the last place that people can go for help. And so it is filling up with mental health people and there are no beds outside to send them to. So they're right. ending up sitting in the emergency room for eight, 10 days. Wow. And I, you know, they just don't get better in that environment. No. So they're that long. They're staying in the emergency department. Yeah. Not all of them. And yeah. this is not only adults, it's kids too. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. So it's, uh, so, yeah, and you had wanted to be a doctor at one point. I did. So that's, part of, that's the medical part that I just really drink it all in. Yeah. I love it. And, it. and of course, when I was on ski patrol, I did a lot of medical kind of stuff too. Right, okay. And then you've got your photography and I know you spend a lot of time finding the right picture, like what's behind you. Um, you know, I know that, you. That's well, extemporaneous. I was walking in Battery Park in February, a couple of years ago, and I didn't have my camera with me, except I had my phone. And that's what this is. Wow. The best <laughs> camera you've got is the one you've got with you. That's right. That's right. So that's another big slice of who you are right now. So you're doing videography, you're doing photography, you're doing, you're working up at the emergency department. 
and some do those three things help you define yourself they have, those... re, they have helped me redefine myself yes yeah. i yeah. uh i mean this has all kind of happened during COVID too which is weird interesting huh uh a little bit before but um i mean i've been a photographer all my life i just haven't been as passionate about it as i am right now mm. um the equipment has really got me going because it's so good now um and uh i mean COVID has made us all be pretty isolated so i've yeah. had to do isolating things to stay normal yeah and photography, getting out into the, you know, world, hiking, doing a lot of hiking, okay. taking a lot of uh, um, uh, landscapes, and I have fallen in love with butterflies, hmm. and uh, have I have shot butterflies that I didn't even know existed, and they are just so beautiful. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, um, I hope you'll share picture or two of those on this interview as well i could do that yeah that would be great yeah um, um so what's the future hold for you where are you going what's the next chapter well for the time being depending on the powers that be i really want to stick with the emergency department for a while mm -hmm. um, i would like to do some more traveling uh, i've been to iceland to visit my son's work That's and great. took 1500 pictures while i was there wow. but uh <laughs> i i only just touched just scratched the surface for that place it's an amazing place mm. and i've had those pictures uh up at the hospital in the hallway in the icu and they're now over in maltex building oh wonderful okay yeah. so huh. and i've got a show that i my doctor wants to put in her office on uh, the butterflies but uh wonderful you know he the problem is framing this thing yeah you know yes. that's expensive stuff yes. uh, so i'd like to do a little bit more traveling one of my former employees at the record company ended up being an engineer uh at sony and then uh, for CNN, he did all the football work, and uh, he retired and bought a bar in Costa Rica. Oh my goodness. And I want to go down and visit him and do some photography. Yeah, yeah, a beautiful, lush country. Yeah, so, <laughs> and I'll go anywhere, really. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, living on Social Security and, and you know, a half-time job is is not uh, having expected to sell my company rather than you right. know, living on social security. Right, right, yeah. So is there anything that we haven't touched on that you would like to share with the audience, Michael? I think we're pretty good. Yeah, you, been, you went down through the list pretty well. It's been a very nice spending time with you and a rich life i i just thought of one of the mottos that i like to go by yeah um actually there's two of them but um don't don't get mired in the illusions of the past and the future you only live in this moment yeah and that has been such a learning curve for me and yeah. and such a relief yeah for me to realize that i don't have to worry about the past or the future that's right I just live right now. One more thing I want to touch on before we close. Um, your faith, your Catholic faith, what has that meant for you? Say that again. My what? Your Catholic faith. Oh, okay. Well, I when I ended up at college, actually when my mom died, I kind of lost track of my Catholic faith. Okay. Um, I uh, have found spirituality in the 12-step program. Mm -hmm. and um realized you know i'm i'm mature enough now so i realized some of the stories that i misinterpreted as a young catholic um were in my own mind it, it was what i came to uh, i didn't really like the god that was imposed on me back then 
And um, again, I found my own spirituality. I, I am not, uh, I don't consider myself, I consider myself a recovering Catholic. Okay. Yeah. And uh, although, you know, love Father Dodge who lived with yep. us, and many priests and, you know, I, I don't have any ax to grind. Yep. against it i just have found my own thing you found your own path that's uh, yep. yep. And Great. part of that is uh another saying that i really like and i think this came from eckhart tolle and that is death is not the opposite of life death is the opposite of birth and life is an eternal continuum mm. Mm. that's sort of relieving to to hear yeah. that Exactly. Yeah. And, and you're, uh, you're, you're living it. I'm trying. I, yeah, you you're know, doing, a, it's, doing a darn good job, Michael. Well, I just wanted to tell you how much you've meant to me in, in my uh, work at the Turning Point and how you brought that organization into its own self that was kind of blundering along, you know, all with good intention, but you know, Absolutely. Gary DeCarroll has brought it into a real world scenario that is making a big difference. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time today, too. My pleasure. Had All a right. good time. Yeah, same here. All I'll right, see you Gary. around the corner. Take care. All right. Bye bye.